As gear ranges expand and technology advances, the drivetrain has gotten more complex over the years. So today, I wanna to give you a brief rundown of the individual components that make up a drivetrain and explain briefly what they each do. And of course, I'm gonna go into deeper detail of each component in subsequent videos, so be sure to check those out too. Now the workhorse of your drivetrain is the chain, and boy do we ask a lot of it. The chain is made up of individual links, which are in turn made up of individual components. There's an inner plate, an outer plate, pins, and rollers. And essentially all of that is to provide that force between your chain rings and your cassette. Each plate on the chain has what's called a chamfer. And the chamfer is basically like a little bevel edge. And that bevel edge aids in shifting side to side on the cogs, both on the front and on the rear when you're shifting with your, on your cassette or on your chain rings. Chains used to have bushings in them as well. And that was to allow some lateral movement so that the chain could actually travel from one cog to another. Today's chains actually are a bushingless design. The plates themselves are shaped slightly uh, where they meet with the pins so that it accomplishes essentially the same goal. There's enough lateral movement in the chain that it can jump from cog to cog without being sloppy and, and causing drop shifts or, or things like that. So the chain is pretty much the key to your entire drivetrain. It really pays to keep it nice and clean. Uh, the dirtier your chain gets, the slower it is, first of all, and second of all, it'll wear out a lot faster. The last component of a chain that you probably wanna know about is the master link. Pretty much all chains at this point have some sort of key uh, link. Up front, you've got your chain rings. Now, your chain rings usually come in a pair, you know, two gears. Sometimes there's three. More commonly now, there's even one by drive trains where there's just one chain ring up front. Now, if you've got multiple chain rings, if you look carefully at your bigger chain rings, you'll see that there's on the back, there's shaping, there's ramps. Uh, there's also little round circles called pins. And what these do is essentially help the chain move from the smaller cog to the bigger cog more easily. Those ramps and pins sort of guide the chain along because the, the difference between the small ring and the big ring, especially in a road bike, is pretty big. So it's a pretty big ask for your derailleur and your chain to move that big distance. So those ramps and those pins help the chain move more smoothly from the small rings to the big rings. You'll notice your smallest ring up front probably doesn't have any ramps or pins, and that's because it doesn't really need them. Uh, you don't need those ramps and pins when you're going back down to a smaller chain ring. If you're running a one by drivetrain, which means you only have one chain ring up front, chances are the teeth on your chain ring have a narrow wide profile. What that means is every other tooth on your chain ring is gonna be kind of fat, and then every other tooth on your chain ring is gonna be kind of skinny. And what that does is essentially allow the chain to adhere a little bit more strongly to the chain ring so that you don't drop your chain. Uh, it basically ensures that your, your chain mates well with the chain ring. Most of your shifting is gonna take place in the back. Unlike the front, where you have a big jump from your small ring to your big ring, the rear cassette has smaller jumps in between cogs. This allows you to sort of fine tune your pedaling cadence as you're going along. Like the front shifting system, the cassette also has shaped teeth, and those shaped teeth, again, allow the chain to sort of jump from cog to cog more smoothly. Your chain rings have that as well. There's, there's different shapes of your, your teeth here. Some, sometimes they look worn, it's not actually worn. The, the teeth are just shaped so that they can actually get the chain from one ring to the other uh, more smoothly. The cassette mounts on what's called a free hub body. It mounts on there with, uh, with slots, essentially, and the entire cassette is locked in place with a lock ring that threads into the free hub body. And so you have to make sure that you have the right free hub body for the type of cassette that you have. And that's usually done by brand. The cassette is also mounted on a carrier. Now the carrier essentially holds the individual cogs together. Some cassettes are all one piece, so it's all on the same carrier. Others are multi-piece, so you have maybe the first three or four biggest cogs here are on one carrier, and then the, the other teeth could be individual or on their own carrier. Generally speaking, a multi-piece cassette is gonna be less expensive. It is, it is kind of a pricing endeavor to make a one-piece cassette, but the one-piece cassette also helps eliminate movement between the cogs on your free hub body, which means your free hub body is not gonna wear out as quickly. Okay, inside your cassette, is a free hub body. That's the piece that your cassette mounts to. Now the free hub body is also that piece that makes that noise. 
Uh, and that's, that's what allows you to coast, pedal backwards. The free hub body essentially mounts into your hub shell and there's a pawl system and that allows you to pedal backwards, but when you pedal forward, it locks into place and allows you to have that forward momentum, that forward force. We're gonna talk more about free hubs in another video and the different types of free hub bodies, but the basic rundown is you need to know that there are different free hub bodies for different brands. Shimano has two of them. It's got the standard Shimano 11 speed, 10 speed uh, free hub body. There's also the newer Micro Spline. For SRAM, there's XD and XDR. Those two are not compatible with Shimano. You have to make sure you have the right brand of a free hub body for the right brand of drivetrain. To top that all off, there's also Campagnolo, which has its own free hub body. So rule of thumb, just make sure that your free hub body matches the brand of drivetrain that you have and is current to the, the, the drivetrain that you have. So if you have a newer Shimano system with 12 speeds, you're probably gonna need that micro spline. But if you're in the 11 and 10 range, you're gonna need the older style Shimano free hub body. Perhaps the most glamorous bits of your drivetrain is of course the derailleurs. Everybody knows that the derailleurs catch the eye. You've got the rear derailleur, which has a really unique shape, the front derailleur as well. So let's start with the front derailleur. The front derailleur is comprised of a cage uh, right here, and it's got an inner plate and an outer plate. And essentially these plates push the chain from one chain ring to another. It's pretty simple. This arm that the cage is attached to is called a parallelogram. Essentially what that means is when it moves side to side, it ensures that the plates move parallel to the chain rings. That way you don't get any binding of the chain. It just basically results in smoother shifts. The front derailleur also comes in a bunch of different configurations. So there's top pull, bottom pull, top swing, and bottom swing. And I'll explain all those in another video dedicated just to the front derailleur. But what you do need to know about is these two little screws right here. That's your limit screws. These two screws will limit how far the cage will move outboard or inboard. And they're pretty easy to adjust just using uh, an Allen key usually. And you basically wanna make sure that your cage doesn't push out so far that the chain will jump off the outside or so far in that it'll jump into your bottom bracket shell. On to the star of the show, the rear derailleur. Now the rear derailleur also moves in a parallelogram fashion. It's called a slant parallelogram. Pretty much all modern derailleurs have this design. What that essentially means is as the, the derailleur moves inboard and outboard, the cage here, this piece here, stays parallel to the cassette, but it also moves up and down. So the idea here is that you want this top pulley, this top jockey wheel up here, to be close to the cassette, but not touching it. That way you get smoother and quicker shifts. The way to adjust this up and down motion, or this up and down distance, I should say, is the B limit screw, which is back here behind the battery. Uh, in this case, this is an electronic drivetrain. And that changes the distance between the top of your cage and the cassette. As the derailleur moves toward the bigger cogs, you want your jockey wheel to be close, but not touching. If it's touching, it's gonna to bind up, causing friction. If it's too far away, your, your shifts are gonna be pretty sloppy. Now, like your front derailleur, the rear derailleur also has limit screws, and those limit screws are back here. And they also limit how far the derailleur can move outboard and inboard. And you wanna adjust those so that Obviously, when you shift into the biggest cog, you don't shift right into your wheel, which can cause a lot of damage, break some spokes, and you don't want to go so far outboard either so that the chain can bind between the cassette and your frame. The rear derailleur has two jockey wheels, the top one and the bottom one. This one's called the idler wheel, and this one is essentially, the bottom one is essentially responsible for providing tension. You can see that this cage is spring-loaded. So it provides tension to the system so that, again, you get smooth shifts, but also so you don't drop your chain especially when you hit road chatter or, or other obstacles. The top pulley wheel here is essentially made to keep your chain lined up properly with the cassette. And again, that is adjusted via your limit screws. On cable actuated systems, which this is not, you'll also have a barrel adjuster back here. Now the barrel adjuster is for fine tuning your cable tension, and that is gonna move your derailleur a little, just slightly inboard or outboard, depending on whether you're tightening or loosening. A key component to drivetrain design is the chain line. The chain line refers to the line your chain essentially makes between your front chain rings and your rear cassette. 
you want it to be fairly straight, and that way you're not putting undue strain on the chain, which can lead to premature wear and friction. So generally speaking, you want to avoid what's called cross-chaining. So when you're in the largest one up front and the largest one in the rear, that's called cross-chaining. Your chain is essentially slanted. Uh, works the same way, vice versa. So if you're in the smallest cog back here and the smallest up front, you're gonna be cross-chained. In the past, it was very, very much frowned upon to cross-chain. Drivetrains are now a little bit better at handling this, so you can get away with it more often, especially now that one-by drivetrains, where you only have one single ring up front, uh, have become so popular. So the chains are, are definitely designed in such a way that they can handle this. You still basically want to avoid it if you can, but it's not the end of the world if you don't. So those are the key components of a drivetrain. Now, essentially the, uh, the end goal here is to propel you forward. Now, if that was the only goal, you would be pedaling forever. You'd be on a fixed gear. Uh, that's the key to drivetrains is freewheeling. So you're able to stop pedaling when you need to. Now, the derailers uh, and the chain and the cassettes and the chain rings have all advanced to the point now where shifts are incredibly fast, incredibly smooth. We've even moved beyond cable actuated systems to electronic systems and now even wireless systems. So there's a lot to dive into there. And of course, I'm gonna dive into a lot of that in subsequent videos that I hope you will check out here on Preen TV.